ho ho and hello. I'm Mark Rees and welcome to this Christmas special of my curious ghosts and folklore podcast where on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject. And on this episode I will be telling you A ghost story for Christmas. Yes, I am going to continue that time-honoured tradition, much like M.R. James or Charles Dickens or the BBC in the 1970s. And while I can't compete with the likes of M.R. James or Charles Dickens, I can still try my best to send a shiver down your spine this festive season and the one advantage I do have over the likes of M.R. James and Charles Dickens and there are not many of them but the one advantage I do have is that the ghost story I am about to tell you is a real life story. This story was recalled by witnesses who claim they had paranormal experiences on Christmas Eve. Now, this story takes place in a pub called the Castle Hotel. The Castle Hotel in Neath, a wonderful historic pub bang in the middle of the town. And regardless of the supposed ghosts that are said to be there, I think it's a fascinating place, regardless. It began life in 1695 as a coaching inn, and all of the the great and the good people who travelled to Neath would stay at the Castle Hotel. And one of the big names they liked to name drop who did go there was the Napoleonic hero, Lord Nelson, who went there with his mistress, Lady Hamilton, en route to Milford Haven. And to commemorate this, a room was named the Nelson Room in his honour. Now, that Nelson Room also played an important role in Wales's national sport because it was in that room the Welsh Rugby Union were formed in 1881. And for me personally, never mind rugby and Napoleonic heroes, the one that really impresses me is that arguably Wales's finest actor, or as far as I'm concerned, finest actor and fellow Port Talbot man, Richard Burton, also had his room there where he would stay with his on-off wife, Elizabeth Taylor. And that room is also now known as the Burton Room. Now, that's all well and good, but I appreciate you are not listening to this for a history lesson. Rather, you want to hear about the ghosts. And what I'd like to do is to begin by looking at the general apparitions who are said to be haunting this historical pub. And then we will look specifically at those Christmas time ghosts. And I'd also like to give a quick shout out before I get into these tales, because there is a local historian in Neath called Robert King, and I don't know of anyone who has written so extensively about supposed hauntings in one location as Robert. He is it's, it's incredible the amount of information, the amount of things he knows about ghosts in Neath. And he was kind enough to meet with me and chat with me as I was researching a book called Paranormal Wales. And the Castle Hotel does feature in that book. But Robert was kind enough to meet with me and to, to talk to me about some of these stories, to give me some more detail and background into some of them. And what was really fascinating, I thought, is some of his research does go back over the the decades now, but he keeps on top of it. And he told me that he had been speaking to members of staff at the hotel recently. So, I mean, this was in 2019 when I spoke to him. So quite recently, he had been speaking to members of staff And to quote, he said they were still experiencing frights there. And I love that word. People are experiencing frights. So while the dates of some of these accounts might go back years, decades, centuries, people are still apparently experiencing frights 
in the Castle Hotel in Neath. And once again, a huge, huge thank you to Robert King for all of his help as I researched this venue. Now, as with most historical places, it does have its regular paranormal visitors. It's local legends which people have been reporting since time began. Now, as mentioned, in the late 17th century, it was a coaching inn, and it was the stopping off point for the mail coach, and just outside the pub were the stables and the coach house where the horses could be rested. Now, this area has been totally redeveloped nowadays. There's a lovely little restaurant there, which I'm, I'm quite familiar with myself, but in the night time, people say they can hear the eerie neighing of horses and the clanging of the blacksmith's hammers filling the night air. And while I don't know if this is supernatural or not, I can confirm that there, to the best of my knowledge, are no horses and no blacksmiths near that restaurant nowadays. Now that is just outside, inside the pub. There is a lady in white, a good old lady in white, and she is said to be wearing a white robe and she walks the corridors at night. There is also a lady in black, another familiar variety of apparition, and this one descends the staircase before exiting the main doors which fly open at her approach. Another local spook, and this is one that Robert did give me some nice little bits of information about, which, as far as I know, hadn't been published before, but there's a boy said to be an Edwardian boy, so this is early 1900s, and he has been seen by, to quote, many people playing in the green room. And Robert says, and again I'm quoting, that he is not a naughty boy, he's just running around, he's just playing and there's a hidden trap door in this room, which you would not see. The room is open to the public, so you can go in there and sit and have a drink, and you would be totally oblivious to the fact that there is a hidden trap door which leads to a kitchen beneath street level. Now, there are some stories about some unusual activity in that old kitchen as well, but that, as they say, is a story for another day. Now, a rather unique ghost seen in the Castle Hotel, although this is another popular form of these old gothic characters who pop up in ghostly stories like the ladies in white and the ladies in black, and that is the ghost known as the Headless Cavalier. Now, the Headless Cavalier was spotted by a customer who, apparently, is not known for his flights of fancy, a level-headed customer. And as he sat there, alone, one day, reading his newspaper, he noticed, next to him, the feet of a fellow drinker. So he lowered his paper to see who it was, and his eyes raised from the feet up towards the man's body, and he was attired as if from the 17th century which does go back to when this pub was first opened, but attired as if from the 17th century. And then he raised his eyes up towards the man's face, and I'm sure you can see where this is going, based, based on the fact that he's called the Headless Cavalier, but he raised his eyes to the man's face, and there was something missing. You guessed it, his head. And with that, the Headless Cavalier disappeared. Now, that man was drinking in the bar area downstairs. But if you head upstairs towards the rooms, there are some strange accounts of things happening in the corridors. Now, I have already spoken of the fact that the lady in white and the lady in black have been seen walking these corridors. And these corridors do tie in with the Christmas story I am about to tell you. But people have reported a supernatural chill in the corridors leading to the guest rooms. It just gets icy, icy cold. And there is one room in particular which, in inverted commas, is thought to be the most haunted room in the hotel. 
So if you are booking a room in the hotel and you would like to see ghosts, this is the one to book. If you would not like to see ghosts, book one of the other rooms. And that room is number 16. Number 1616 in particular is thought to be the most haunted room in the hotel where poltergeist activity has caused members of staff to flee, according to the reports of Robert King. And one theory as to the angry spirit's identity, the one causing this poltergeist activity, is that she, it's a she, was a chambermaid who fell pregnant. In a way, young chambermaids were not supposed to fall pregnant. It was with a huntsman. It was not with her husband. It was something she should not have been doing. And yet, when she implored him to marry her afterwards, he refused. Now, this was in 1845, apparently. In 1845, in the Victorian age, and by all accounts, having a child out of wedlock was not the done thing. Having a child with some huntsman who was just visiting the hotel was a definite no-no. As a result, this poor chambermaid, this desperate chambermaid with nowhere left to turn, hung herself in the corridor. She was hanging over the stairs. And people say to this day that as you walk down New Street in Neath, alongside one corner of the Castle Hotel, you can see that chambermaid peering from the window which overlooks the street below. And on that eerie note, let us now turn to this ghost story for Christmas. The strange activity which takes place at the Castle Hotel in Neath. And I think as I tell you this story, there may or there may not be a connection with some of this other reported activity. Could that Edwardian boy who's just running around playing be involved? Could the lady in white, could the lady in black who walk the corridors be involved? Could this icy chill, could this tragic young chambermaid who fell pregnant and took her own life have some connection with this Christmas time phenomena? Well, I'll let you decide after telling you the story. Now, our story begins in 1998. There was a lot of festive spirit in the pub that night. And by spirit, I mean the traditional over-the-counter spirits, not the spooky kind of spirits that we talk about on this podcast. Or maybe you could say there were two types of spirit in the pub that night. Now, the staff were quite keen to get that place empty, locked up, and to get out and to, well, presumably get back to their own families ready for the big day. The bar was cleaned, the bar was closed, and only two people remained in that darkened hotel. It was the deputy manager and a fellow worker. And as they sat in the foyer, they heard a commotion upstairs. It sounded as if somebody was running along the landing. Now, there had been a lot of merrymaking that night. Maybe one of the locals had had one too many and was running around upstairs, so they decided to go and investigate. And upon doing so, they did not find any human being then running around, but they did find a scene they were not expecting. All of the doors to the bedrooms, to those guest rooms, were wide open, and the lights in each room had been switched on. Now, this pub had been shut for the night. It had been shut for Christmas. They were ready to go home. Somebody had gone round every room, unlocking and opening the doors and switching on all of the lights. They searched for a culprit, but they couldn't find a soul. And so in the end, they thought, well, look, let's just lock up again and get out of here. They went round each room. They turned off the lights once more. They locked the doors once more. And before going, they decided they should alert the owner. Now, I should point out quickly that this was in 1998. It has changed hands since then, maybe several times since then. But the owner at the time came along to see for themselves and they brought their dog with them. 
Now, as regular listeners will know, I do like mentioning dogs on my ghost stories on this podcast. And if you go back to back to June or July, I had about three or four episodes about dogs in a row, including episode number... Number six, I believe, was the real-life Scooby-Doo dog who hunted ghosts, which is possibly my favourite Welsh ghost story ever. If you did want to go and listen to more dog stories afterwards, that's episode six. But in this case, there was another ghost-hunting Scooby-Doo dog who was taken along to the Castle Hotel by the owner who joined his deputy manager and a fellow member of staff to investigate the strange happenings on Christmas Eve. Now, the four of them, well, (laughs) three of them plus dog, I guess you could say four, it is uh, one of them. The four of them went upstairs together to investigate. Now, the two who had already been up there were slightly more nervous about it, but the four of them went upstairs, and sure enough, they found the lights were all back on and the doors were wide open once more. Now, they had only just turned off those lights and locked those doors, and if this was somebody playing a practical joke, they were very, very quick about it, and they had some secret hiding place because they could find nobody, but they went upstairs, the scene had been reset, the doors were wide open, the lights were on, and then the dog became agitated. Something was not right. That dog knew that something was not right. And it began to run around, darting from room to room to room. And the other three, they had another look. They searched everywhere. There was no trace of anyone, living or otherwise. Now that, in and of itself, is, I think, an interesting ghost story. There were three, maybe four if you include the dog, witnesses to these unusual events they could find no explanation but our story does not end there two years later in the year 2000 on the same night december the 24th christmas eve the sound of footsteps were heard dashing along the landing of the empty pub now this time it is not known if they went upstairs to investigate But you could say that's one heck of a coincidence for the same phenomena to repeat itself. Now, at this point, Robert King did publish his book, which is where I first found this story. And as mentioned, after speaking to Robert, he did tell me that people were still experiencing frights. Whether or not those frights include Christmas Eve frights, I do not know. But I certainly like to think so. Now, very quickly, I do spend a lot of time in Neath at Christmas, as you do, uh, because I live quite closely and I do a lot of work and stuff there. And I pop in to the Castle Hotel round about Christmas. And I'll be honest, I have not seen anything paranormal there myself, but I have had a lovely pint and a lovely glass of wine. So if you do find yourself in Neath, I can recommend popping in for a drink And if you really want to find them, maybe you could go for a wander and look for these ghosts. Maybe by the trapdoor. Maybe in the corridors to the guest rooms. Maybe you can see them watching you from the windows outside in New Street. All of which brings me to the point in the episode where I like to ask if you've had any experiences, be it in the Castle Hotel in Neath or any other pub in Wales or the world. Do you know of any other Christmas spirits of the paranormal variety which are said to be in these pubs? Do they make an appearance on December the 1st, maybe January the 1st, December the 24th, or 31st, maybe every single day of the advent calendar? If so, it's always great to hear from people. You can track me down, even if it's just to say hello. Just do a search for Mark Rees, And if you put the word ghosts or folklore or podcast in, I will pop up on top and you can find my website or you can find me on social media and we can have a chat online all about this spooky stuff. And just very quickly, as always, if you have enjoyed this episode, please consider hitting the subscribe button because that way you will never miss an episode ever. And I've got some more Christmas specials on the way, including... One about a magical Christmas tree 
next week. How many podcasts talk about magical Christmas trees? Just mine. Well, probably. But if you hit subscribe, you will definitely not miss any of them. And you will make me happy. Think of it as a Christmas present to me. Because I know if people are subscribing, you are enjoying what you are listening to and you would like to hear more. And if you find yourself at a loss this Christmas Eve with nothing to do, maybe you could pop along to your local and see if they have any unexpected visitors joining them for the occasion. And one quote I find which crops up again and again when I research old ghost stories in the newspapers, especially those from the archives, is a quote from William Shakespeare's Hamlet. And I thought it was quite appropriate that I've already mentioned Richard Burton in this episode. I Well, I mention Richard Burton a lot on, on this podcast because he is uh, one, of my, one of my heroes. But it is often said by people who don't believe in any of this stuff. They don't believe in ghosts. But when they are forced to recall an experience they cannot explain away otherwise, they often resort to just saying, well, there are more things in heaven and earth. Horatio, than I dreamt of in your philosophy. And with one of Richard Burton's more famous roles being in Hamlet, I thought that would be quite an appropriate quotation to slip in to this episode. And this got me thinking, I've recorded an episode about ghost stories in Wales on Christmas Eve, and I've managed to shoehorn Richard Burton in as well. But did you know that in 1965, Richard Burton published a book? He's not really known for publishing books. He is known for his big Hollywood roles. But he published a book, and that book was called A Christmas Story. Now, it is autobiographical in a way, and talks of his childhood growing up just down the road in Tybark in Port Talbot. And I think... That would be a lovely way to finish this episode. Because not only does he name drop Charles Dickens, arguably the inventor of the greatest Christmas ghost story, he paints a vivid picture of an idealised Christmas in Wales, which never quite happened. And he tipped his hat to his good friend Dylan Thomas, who did the same. Now, Dylan Thomas and his A Child's Christmas in Wales will also be making an appearance on this podcast over Christmas. But to finish this ghost story, I'd like to leave you with the first sentence from that book, that festive book, from Richard Burton. And before I do, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian and Grando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore from Wales podcast. It's the best, it's the beautiful, it's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And to quote Richard Burton, there were not many white Christmases in our part of Wales in my childhood? Perhaps only one or two? But Christmas cards and Dickens and Dylan Thomas and wishful memory have turned them all into white. Every Christmas in Wales is white, whether it was or not. Until next time, Merry Christmas, Nadolik Lawen and Nostar. No